Welcome to Human Tech, a podcast by the intersection between humans and technology. Now, this show is a road show. We're actually on the road, and here with me live in studio, as it were, is Susan. Hi. I know. I'm sitting right next to you. That doesn't usually happen. Yeah. So normally, um, Susan's up in Wisconsin, and I'm in Chicago, but uh, we are on the road in Champaign. Illinois. Champaign, Illinois, and we brought our mic equipment with us. So we could do this podcast. So, yeah, so we have a live podcast here. Now, a couple of caveats. Um, I am sitting in a giant lazy boy chair. <laughs> but you're not like, you don't have it reclined backwards. No, I don't have it reclined, reclined backwards, but still, like, um, just so, like, if I, like, move. We're going to hear this. Like, hear the... <laughs> the squeaky chair. Yeah, I, I'm not, I'm just in a, like, a regular office yeah. Chair, so, so, so I have, might not. So we apologize squeak. in advance if if there's any weird noises. It's yeah, these things happen. Okay, um, we wanted to do a topical podcast today um, because something happened two days ago. <laughs> yeah, we wanted to um, uh, Bre- Brexit, which is the British's. Uh, what does Brexit stand for? Britain's exit. Oh well, that makes sense. I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, from the European Union. Yes, from the European Union. So as one, we want to talk a little bit about that. So it'll be a little political, but we also want to talk about, um, I don't know, why there seems to be a this backlash, and we're seeing it in the States and a bunch of different countries against globalization, and uh, that's kind of interesting because it's also a backlash kind of against technology and... You know, the... So, yeah, so we thought we'd talk about this this intersection, because you're always talking about intersections, mm-hmm. between, you know, like social connections, social media, technology, global issues, well, politics. We thought, we thought we were making a global unified culture. And, and we thought the internet... We thought Europe, at least, was definitely over it, you know? And we thought the internet would, would really uh, speed up that process, right? Yeah. Uh, and now we're beginning to wonder. Well, there seems to be, definitely oh. for some people, there definitely seems to be a backlash against the whole system. So um, I guess I'll start with a short overview. Uh, do you want to give the Brexit overview? Oh, no, definitely you can give the Brexit overview. You're the econ major. All right, I give you the, I give everyone listening the little two-minute version. Uh, I'm not an expert on this. I haven't even followed it that closely. And you're not British either. I'm not British, purely in American perspective. So basically, um, the Prime Minister of England was facing opposition from uh, some of the right political movements who were angry at some of the rules that the EU issues on England. For those of you who don't know, the EU stands for the European Union, and it's, it's not... It's kind of like the federal government in the You know, the United we've done States. some work for the European Union. Yeah, uh, this is also another reason we want to do this. The European Union is actually one of our clients. Uh, we, you went over to... Brussels. Brussels. And Taught uh, a workshop. The European Commission, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so they're one of our clients. So, it, you know, we, we actually... It is of interest to us. It is for, of interest to us. For many reasons. European Union, you should bring us back. We could have we helped. Oh, we couldn't have helped with this. <laughs> I have the belief that we can help with anything. Uh huh. Okay. So, um, okay. So basically, <laughs> the European Union. So, so we have the federal government. And the federal government in the United States is set up by the Constitution. The Constitution uh, kind of establishes what powers over the states they have. There's really nothing like that in the EU. And so, that what the EU is is a large series of treaties. That's really all it is. Uh, because each country is still a country. They're sovereign, independent states. But yeah. they've all signed these series of treaties. Some of them have not signed some of the treaties. Some of them have signed all the treaties. Some of them have signed other treaties. Um, that essentially uh, gives power, governing power, to the European Union. So just for a sense of scale, the federal budget for the United States is about $4 trillion a year. Yeah. Um, and, the, and the budget for the EU is about I don't know, $200 billion. So a lot less. It's big, yeah, but a lot less. So if you're looking at power, most of the you know most of the power does remain. Most of the money that's being spent is being spent spent by by the the, individual individual countries. countries. Now they do have a ton of power when it comes to trade. So the big one is trade, trade agreements, Um, business uh, uh, back and forth. Absolutely. So and and also though the other big one 
is the movement of people. Yeah, so you have the movement of people and money that's all standardized. Yeah. Um, so basically, the, what it, the, the big thing that the EU did was it made the European Union essentially from security and business standpoints like one country. Yeah. So if, you, if you're, if you're a, a, a tech company and you want to sell you know, phones in China or in any country, you have to get registered and get approval and to go through all this proper work and paces. But? Well, with the European Union, you only have to do that once. You do that once with any country in the European Union. In the Union, European Union. And you're kind of automatically, you're, you, you, can, can, you don't need to worry about redoing it. You can sell to the rest of the EU. Yeah. So that's the, that's the big thing. And so, for example, um, a lot of American banks have large headquarters and offices in London. It's became because that, that they could then do business from London anywhere in, in Europe. In Europe. Yeah, without having to do anything. Um, another example... Right, so think of people in the EU can travel freely. They can travel and they can go work. And they, yeah, they have the same passport. They, they have the same other work countries. pieces. Um, all the environmental standards are the same. And uh, now, now, not all of it. So you, so you got to remember, for example, England never joined the euro. Um, and yeah, so and not everything's Norway, the same. So Norway is not part of the EU. But what they essentially did was they negotiated kind of favored nation status with the EU. So they're like, we don't really want to join. But, but we do want to do some of the things. Yeah. So essentially what the EU said is, look, you're basically part of the EU. We understand you don't really want to fit, formally join. Do X, Y, and Z, and we'll give you nice provisions. You know, because you, the European Union, again, they have power to dictate who sells to what and how they sell. All right. So if they have GMO crops or whatever. All right. So now let's go. So let's go. Let's, let's go, to go back to England. Um, so part of the other thing is the freedom of movement. And so there are migrants and refugees, among other things, that are coming to Britain. And I'm not going to pretend I completely understand all the British nuances of politics. But essentially, a big part of it was... Um, the European Union could dictate who, or Britain, for, for the most part, couldn't dictate who comes in and comes could out of their country. Dictate, That's, yeah. They give that power to the European Union, um, among among other things. And so there was a uh, movement in the on the right, political right of Britain to to opt out of the European that Union. That said, we'd be better off if we were just back with our, had our own currency and our own well, they, trade they rules. They have their own currency. Oh, they did have their own currency. They That's still right. Do. I forgot. They didn't, they didn't all do. right. So it wasn't the currency, but it was no, all the but, trade rules right, yeah. and the immigration. Yeah. So all right. Um, so David Cameron, which is the prime minister of England, said, "All right, look, this is stupid. We we're not getting anywhere. We're just fighting each other. Let's you know, I'm going to throw you a bone. Okay, pass these measures that we want. That that I'm pushing for." You mean he was telling the European Union? No, no, no. He was telling the the, the right oh, the, political uh, in his block. country. Yeah. Okay. And in exchange, what we'll do is I will we'll hold a vote, we'll oh. hold a national referendum. That's why they had the that, referendum uh, about so they should did we leave that. the European Union, right? And what you're going to find, he said, was is that, that people... England wants to be in the European Union, and therefore they'll resoundingly defeat this. And when they defeat this, therefore I'll have a mandate to pass all the stuff I want to pass. And then. Well, it got very heated, and it was a big thing, and people were like, well, this is kind of, kind of nuts. But but in theory, uh, if you remember, they had the, what is it, the Scotland or Wales voted to stay in the United Scotland. Kingdom. Scotland. So was Scotland. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they had the secession vote. So and they thought failed. it would kind of go that way. And yeah, that's what they thought. And, and it didn't. And it didn't. <laughs> so It was very close, uh, and it didn't. And uh, you kind of see... Again, it's kind of the urban divide. So, you know, urban London, very pro staying really? in, in the uh, EU. And then other more rural areas wanted out. Yeah. I've also heard, uh, or, you know, when I was reading on the news that it's a uh, young old, mm-hmm. that the, the older people in general wanted out and the younger people wanted in. All right. Demographically, it very, very much kind of mirrors the, a lot of the, Trump right support in the United in the States US. and other countries too. All right, so so then, and and this is surprising a lot of people. Well, and let me well let me just quickly say like a now what, because that was the then, and now I gotta say what the consequences. Okay, are. Okay, what are the consequences? So first, the vote actually doesn't mean anything. It doesn't. No, it actually doesn't. Um, the oh. the EU has a. Uh, so it's not like the Britain's out. So, 
Yeah, it's very. Britain has to file paperwork to get out and yeah, all that it's, stuff. Yeah, yes, it's it's very it's very much like, well, it's not the, it's not the same as like the South seceding, but uh, when <laughs> no, but when the South seceded, the states just passed they passed laws that said we are now seceding, right? Yeah. But that right that doesn't that doesn't not, mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. What happens? Um, so the vote doesn't mean anything. The European Union does have a kind of an opt out clause, which says that. A nation can formally opt out of the European Union, and once the government opts out, then there are two years of negotiations that then. Oh. Yeah. That it, I thought it, this was all going to happen right away. It tri- well, it triggers a two-year negotiation oh, period between the host country and the European Union about how it's all going to work and what treaties they're dissolving if they're dissolving all the treaties. Because you got to remember, now once you opt out, like, <laughs> it's not like the opt like the op- like England gets to call the shots. Right. The European Union now, because England's not in it, can play hardball. They can do whatever and they, they want. Can be, and so, so there's a feeling in the European Union, oh, fine. playing hardball? You want out, you got out. Oh. So now we're going to have all these tariffs oh. and fees and make so life really tough. This is much messier than I thought. Well, or they'll play nice and they'll be like, oh, it's oh, fine. Oh, it's okay. We'll just we'll we'll, keep we, all the nice tra- like to do trade treaties. We won't have any tariffs. So we don't know how this is going to play out. No, and the, and the other thing is that, again... The vote they had, England's still in the European Union. They're in the right. European Union until, until David Cameron, they, the Prime Minister, actually files the opt-out paperwork. And then all and the a, two years of and there's a question upon when he's going to do that. And so the EU um, has been like, let's get it going. Like if you're going to do this, let's get you out. Do it. And if you're not going to do it, don't. But don't, don't like mess around and like, keep yeah. everyone wondering. So he okay. says he's going to do it. I'm sure he. I'm sure he will. Because if he doesn't, they'll just replace him with someone that who will. I thought he was resigning. He, <laughs> he's resigning, but after he submits the paperwork in a oh, couple months, okay. like it's all. Oh. So, so there's like this, it's just kind of this, this rolling tumble. All right. Um, so what does it mean? Uh, it. The, he had a bad day. He did have, he kind of banked his political future on this. Yeah. Film, okay. All he's, right. He is doing, so what does it mean? Um, it could be very, very significant because what the global financial world is very concerned about is the domino effect. Um, if they're going England out, is not the only one who has gripes about the EU. What country also wants out? And right? then Portugal are, and will Spain. Will they be able to then, hold it together? And, and you got to remember, the EU is the, from a from a economic point of view, yeah. it's the biggest and most important nation on earth. All right. So it's a bigger economy than the United States as a block. So, you know, if it falls apart, it's, it, economically speaking, it's basically the same as if the U.S. government falls apart and now all the individual states are doing their own thing. Oh, that sounds like fun. All right, so tell me though, I, I want to tie this of course to social human tech. Mm-hmm. So how do we do that? I just thought I was going to give a 60 minute lecture <laughs> on Brexit. No, you didn't. The implications no, you of financial didn't. trading <laughs> and how this will reduce probably mortgage prices as you are various not. central banks around the world oh my gosh. forgo their so interest rate increases. <laughs> Yes, Alan Greenspan. Okay. So the uh, economic nerd in you has just uh, shown up. Hey, I, I was one when the wall collapsed. I, I don't get to see... You were one years old? When it collapsed. No, I mean, it was two. How, when, when it collapsed. I don't know. Okay, but what does this have... Oh, so what does that have to do with anything? 89? Well, I, I haven't... I haven't... You haven't experienced, experienced a, a shift a, a in shift, a, a drastic world shift in power. world and the way the world is organized. Mm, okay. In my entire life, and this this would be okay, but if but I, regardless of that, I still want to tie this into. I'm waiting for your okay. So technology you, and you take, well, I want to go back. All right. Well, I want to go back to to what you said at the beginning, where you were talking about. Uh, yeah, I'm the expert here. You can ask me questions. Really? Okay. That's yeah. good. Well, all right. Um, I want to actually bring up a different event. Mm-hmm. Because, and I want to see if we can tie the two together. And you're looking at me like, yeah. what is she going to talk have about now? I the amazing ability to tie any two <laughs> things together. If I just give you two random events. That was really impressive. <laughs> you can tie them. All right, well, we're going to find out. Well, this is not necessarily random. But to me, it 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 bring. I want to come back to this idea of globalization. I want to come back to the idea of social media and technology, and political change. Now, you spent a semester in Cairo, Egypt. 
Yeah, eight months. Eight months. And this was before uh, um, Cairo had its big thing. Yes, I was I was there the year preceding the, year before. the I guess, quote. What's it called? Unquote. Arab Spring or something? Oh, uh, sure. Well, whatever. There was a big disturbance in Cairo. Yes, it was in a couple other countries. Yeah, the, right. The, a year, be, and that was, and I you think, were there. I think, a year I think in Egypt itself, it's probably referred to as like the Tahrir Revolution. If okay. you really want to, but if you want to give it the correct whatever name. you want to call it. Okay. Yeah, uh, I was. I was like the last after they they kind of stopped letting. So, um. So there was a sense for a while, I. Th- so uh, so to me. That had to do with, well, that, I mean, Cairo is a whole other thing from the UK and it has its own <laughs> political, economic, and that you could probably talk for another hour just about that. Multiple hours. Okay. Uh, but but we, had, we have this theme. We have two themes that I think are really, maybe they're not related. One is the idea of social media being involved in political change. Okay. You look very skeptical. Yeah. And the other is um, what you said about globalization and about how the internet would would bring us together. The internet, which I, I, I don't know. I kind of got the feeling that was the world thought that was what was maybe going on in Cairo. Yeah. Yeah. I, maybe it wasn't really, but, you know, the world thought that that technology and the internet it had you know like like it was almost this feeling probably totally false and narrow-minded that you know cairo was waking up you know that there were these young people and 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 they the young people were were online and they were in communication with people from around the world and they were you know and so so you had this whole world that instead of um being so splintered was all kind of coming together so and then we and then then we start singing you know a kumbaya or something and holding hands you know i'd like to buy the world coke and you know or something like yeah. that right so okay. and so so somehow i will I, 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 you had mentioned that maybe that you thought this the brexit vote was a sign that the world isn't all coming together through technology and democratization. So let me and... let me tie this together. Okay. See, you said you could tie anything yeah, together. No, I know. So I'll, I will start. You really that whole long thing was asking me two questions. The first was about uh, social media and revolution. Um, I don't buy into a whole lot of that because that was supposedly really going on in in Cairo. No, it is, but it's like saying what really fuels what really fuels revolution is words, like. Social media is just the communication tool du jour, but and so you you're communicating a little differently. But like, it's like you know when it just it changes things a little bit. But what's that? That's just the medium. What's important is the is communication between people. That's always going to lead to but kind if of spread of but ideas. It, but if the internet and technology makes the communication between people happen easier and faster, then it would. It could spur some of the stuff. Uh, no. What I well, what I think it does is that I think it accelerates. Yeah, there you go. There's yeah. a good word. I don't. I don't think it. But that. But that's important. You know, yeah. So because you can have these tipping. So when points. Martin Luther nailed his seventy-two, you know, theses because to the door of the church, because there was a, a that was a po- press. that was a political uprising. But you know, it took it took like two hundred and fifty years for all the dust to settle. And now with Twitter and people picking science and learning about stuff, right? It takes like two and a half years. By the way, my uh, total aside. Martin Luther wrote a scathing letter to the po- addressed to the Pope. He sent it to the Vatican, in which he called the Pope worse than the devil. So if you if you ever want to see Why someone we... like drop the mic and like really like a total roast, go read Martin, Martin Luther's Luther? like letter to the Pope. It's amazing. Okay, that is off topic. Okay, so um, so let's get back on topic. Okay. So that so I don't want to get into a whole lot of social media and like the Tower Square and Twitter and well because I think that's just ancillary. I think okay. I think we can just accept that the world is 
moving and changing at a much faster pace than it used to. So in that sense, you do think that technology has had an impact. It might only be to accelerate, but yes. it is an impact. Yes, I don't think. Okay. Yeah. So I think I think the spread of ideas and the I, thoughts of revolution and changing the status quo is the same as it's been for since basically the American Revolution, which was the first really modern version of kind of revolutionary that setting we up talk about. Uh no, that's the first one. Okay. It was the first republic since the Roman times, for the most part. Yeah, I don't know if I buy that, but okay. okay. Anyways, um, so, so let's move on to your second question. Which was the Arab... So you mentioned the Arab Spring, and that's what the um, for the Western news outlets kind of pro- proclaimed it as. And you're actually completely right. Really? For once, I'm completely right about something? So, yeah, <laughs> but there's going to be a giant but. I, yeah, I knew that was coming. Yeah. So this idea that um, there were all these young uh, people in Cairo and Tunisia and in the Jordan and Syria and... They were, had been raised on Disney movies, which they have been. No, are you telling me this is the myth or this is the truth? Both. Okay. Because it is so. So I'm gonna I'm gonna telling you the ideals, but there is a there's a ton of truth to it, right? So like when I like people in Cairo, the, the rich, Western educated people, in you know. That, that I, that Young I met. people, they yeah, they love you Disney met. movies. They okay. know all the Disney, right? Yeah. And the ideas of justice and principles, and like you know, these kind of very high-minded, ide- idealistic ideals, really does resonate with them. Okay. okay. Um, and so you saw this huge movement against, you know, decades-long autocratic regimes that had kind of been set up in the during the Cold War, the, the or before balance of power, yeah. yeah. You know, the, you know, the, the, there was the Shah, and then the Shah got taken down, and that was replaced by something, and it, just these weird, you know. So, you know, Mubarak was, anyways. So, so this like this high-minded Western ideal is true. Okay, but but it's only true for maybe twenty percent of the population. Okay. So this idea that Egypt's really young and 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 liberal. They are really young. The median age of, 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 of an Egyptian is 25. Oh, that's really young. At least young. it was a couple of years ago. Maybe it's changed a little bit. So it's a really young country. And okay. it's a big country, too. Yeah. I think there's, I think when I was there, there's like 80 some million people. So okay. it's you know, almost a third of the United States. Like it's, it's a giant. It's a big country. It's a big country. And it's young. And it's swinging um, conservative. Islamic conservative really Even fast. with all the young people. Really, because you're no, the, saying the, yeah, you're saying the it's people. the westernized wealthy young people that were for the whole so, democratization so, but that's a very small group. Yeah, so what happened is and again I'm not an expert on this. I was not there during the revolution. I've talked to Egyptians. I have some idea of their thoughts and feelings, but I'm certainly not an expert. So I definitely want to start there. Um, that they 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 you know they rose up against Mubarak who had been essentially um, a very kind of pleasant uh, you know essentially dictators too strong but a very like a very nice I mean one party rule he'd been in power for thirty years yeah. you know and I I specifically can remember talking to an Egyptian you know do you would so because the worry was that he was going to die. Yeah, and then what was going to happen? People didn't know. People were really scared. Well, I remember... They could never imagine a now, world without... I mean, Mubarak. I do remember when you came back from Cairo. Mm-hmm. You kind of implied... I don't think you used the term powder keg, although maybe you did. Yeah. You implied that th- this was not going to... That what was going on there, it, it was unstable, and it was yeah. going to... Something was going to happen soon. Yeah, and so, so I can't really say... I, w- I mean I, I think I think I was just as stunned as everyone because you, you they saw like like it's like you're on a water slide yeah and you see the water going down the slide yeah and then you start moving on the water slide but it still surprises you when you're on it yeah right like like everyone like so you 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 knew something was going to happen but when it, it happened you were still, still surprised that like it oh my happened. gosh it really happened yeah um so okay so then well, but, well, what well, hold on okay I'll just I'll just finish my point. all right go ahead so that's like maybe 20, 25, 30% of the population. Yeah. You know, especially and maybe a little larger in urban Cairo. Yeah. yeah. You know, the university students. Yeah. 
And then you have a huge swath of the country that's getting um, pretty conservative, very Islamic, uh, quite traditional, and really doesn't like what's happening with the Western values and the you know loose values and the and the very liberal things okay. that the young people are doing. But and there's a and that so that was like the Muslim Brotherhood. Are they so 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 young people who who grow up in that sector rather than the other sector? Are they on the internet as much as the other? I mean, so is it still possibly that it is an internet thing? It's just that you have large, yes. large numbers of people that aren't online. No, and they are online. They are online. They are online. They are texting. Look at ISIS. And, yeah, ISIS, ISIS does online. their whole thing online. Okay, so, all right. So, but they're just, they're going, <laughs> so it accelerates those uh, those exchange of ideas and information. Right, so this is back to your, different stuff. this is back to your idea that it accelerates but yeah. it's not necessarily so, globalization, democracy. So you had this, you know, you know what, you know, this revolution that happened, and it was kind of started by this kind of the, you know the Western thinking democratic people, and then all the very conservative, because um, you got to remember that you know Mubarak, he he was a pretty middle ground kind of guy. I mean, harsh at times, but you know he played both sides of the Soviets, the United States for years. They still get like a billion dollars a year for both, for into like the Soviet Union and the United States, um, which is like Pakistan did. Um, he, you know, he he wasn't very nice to the Christians in the country, which ten percent of the country is like Coptic Christians, but he wasn't. He didn't. You know, he wasn't super mean to them. Yeah. He he wasn't that era, but he wasn't that not. You know, so he so he was. He was for them middle of the road. So he kind of pissed everyone off. <laughs> <laughs> And after thirty years, right? So, so they had this revolution, and the liberal people were like, "Let's let's go," and then the Muslim people were like, "Let's go." Yeah. We need to reform this into a nice yeah. Muslim state, and then so he left, and you had this weird power vacuum, and then things, who knows what's going on there now. All right. So tie Cairo to Brexit. So you're, what you're seeing in Brexit is you're seeing the same thing. You have this. You're 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 seeing the dawn of this global kind of global Western values culture system, right? So people in the young Londoners who like to go and travel, right? They travel all around the EU. They make friends with the EU. They feel connected um, to their fellow, you know, compatriots around the world. Yeah. People in Cairo, they, they maybe they visited Europe. They have friends like me, right, who came yeah, in who and came visited. To, and yeah, yeah. They feel connected to, to other countries. Europe and yeah, Western and ideals and, of freedom. And, yeah. and, and, you know, they're not that religious. They're, they're just these kind of, you know, underlying this movement. Okay. And we've seen it in the U.S. with gay marriage, right? There's, I, I have, and I've said it before and I'll say it again, I think in the U.S. we're actually in the middle of one of the largest cultural revolutions in the history of the United States. But the, but. So what you're seeing now? Go I'm gonna tie it in. Here's your tie, tie in. Sense. All right, here it is. So, um, so you have this huge swing, of all these of these people, maybe twenty, thirty percent, young, uh, educated, people. Yeah. Towards this new global, kind of, uh, liberal, definitely liberal culture. Yeah. And you see, um, more conservative people, generally older, but not always necessarily. Um, who see this as an attack on their way of life. And so you're seeing the backswing, the backlash to this, to this big globalization and to the rapid acceleration of change that's happening. Mm-hmm. They see it as an attack on their values mm-hmm. and an attack on um, their, you know, their culture and their space and their communities. And they want, um, they, they see it as an evil. And so you are, and so they're, they are swinging back. So do you think it's fair to say, if we think about... And they seem to be a bigger group. <laughs> which one? The, 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 backlash. the backlash. So, well, yeah, yeah. Okay. So we could say then, if we think again about technology, uh... It's it's actually then accelerating the polarization. It does appear to be doing that, doesn't it? I mean, it, 
right? Because you've got, basically what you're saying is you've got, you had this, this pull towards um, the liberalization, cultural liberalization from the young people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, part of that was globalization. Part of that was the fact, perhaps, that, 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 that young people were having, had the opportunity to interact with more diverse people? What, what, what's causing this liberalization? I mean, you know, is it, it does it have that have anything to do with technology or? I think so. I mean, so, I mean, I, it's tough to put your finger on it. I mean, he, again, younger generations, especially in the United States, but for the most part, there's a giant. Uh, well, I know, I, there's another they're theory. They're more liberal. There's another theory. Which is? That people basically end up believing whatever is a tv sitcom okay i'm not kidding i'm not i'm not and so there has been uh you know at the in the and so that it's tv sitcoms that move us all forward although you could say that maybe the tv sit so when you started seeing gay people in tv sitcoms you know or a, a lot of international people interacting together in tv sitcoms that that then then all that becomes just kind of normal. Mm-hmm. That's what people believe is normal. But you could also see it the other way around, no, which is yeah. the TV is just reflecting yeah, what no, I people believe. See, well, no, I don't think... I don't, I don't see how the TV sitcoms have changed so much in the 90s that 80% of people under the age of, like, 35 vote for Bernie Sanders. I, I don't... Right? Like, I yeah, don't see, yeah. like... Yeah, how is it, yeah, yeah. How is, has I, Bernie... So I, I no, that, I think yeah. I think I think it's more of a cause and effect situation. Okay, all right. So I, I so I don't know why younger people are much more liberal. Maybe I think I have a couple suspicions um, that they're less religious, that they have been exposed to different cultures um, and different beliefs. Well, and there's that accepting. there's that research in the fourth turning book by the. Uh, historian named Howe, H-O-W-E, that says that this is just what happens every 80 years. Yeah, hey, that, yeah well, He goes be. back and analyzes these cycles and says, yeah, you have uh, it, things build and they get really more and more conservative and then you get the young people who are become more liberal, but then, of course, it turns around and you end up back, eventually yeah, you end up just, back where you were you before. You just get those, like, these two... These, these pendulum. two pendulums, right? right so like, right. so like, you have this huge. The, the young people are swinging really, really liberal, like really liberal, um, in all these countries, and in some cases, uh, that wins. So like, if you look at Canada, right? They had Justin Trudeau, really liberal. Yeah, um, but it doesn't go everywhere because you said the Cairo mm-hmm. people were for hey, the most part not. I mean, really liberal. Your results are all based on percentages, right? If you look, look, look at Brexit, okay. Fifty-two forty-eight. Yeah, it's really close. Really tight, and I mean Cairo. It, again, it's tough because it's it's so it's like so it's like in Cairo, people and it, you have seeing in the United States too. You're seeing it all over the world. People are swinging to the polls. There's that polarization. You're, you're people are swinging conservative and swinging liberal at the same time, really violently. Not the same person. You're just saying that, that no, there are these no, no, no. The polarization is happening. Yes, in, in these countries. And so you're seeing it manifest in different ways. And it's right now, in, in you know, so you have the whole Arab Spring thing, which, you know, the, and that's what happened, right, is that they all wanted change. And then half the people wanted this Western democracy and the other half wanted, yeah, democracy, but also with all these, you know, um, kind of more Islamic values and, you know. That, and so we can. So, so it just nothing ever happens. So, do you think? And I think we might have met, we might have touched on this on a previous episode. Do you think that because of the polarization and then combined with the acceleration of media, um, that people tend? Is it possible that that? Let's see. How am I want to say this? You know, there was this idea. That when we went to getting your information online 
it would mean you'd have so much more information available to you rather than just reading the one newspaper you're used to reading you know you'd have this point of view and that point of view you know it would just open up all these horizons it seems like what happens in reality is that it narrows you you just start to feed yourself <laughs> or you know or facebook feeds to you or what whoever <laughs> you start getting fed this is like really narrow little ribbon and so all you have all this information coming at you and you have the sense that you're getting the broad view but actually you just you just keeps narrowing and narrowing to this little little stream of that kind of exactly fits uh you know your little story of who of who you think you are and who who facebook or you know anyone else thinks you are and so that rather than ha having all this technology you know give us this bigger broader view it's actually narrowing the information yeah and it i think it has to do with our self stories i mean if you look t pre-internet right in the 1970s your self story of who you were um, as a person and as a community was largely geographical because who did you hang out with? Who did you talk to? You talked to the people who were around you. How else? What else would you do, right? Well, you did. You sometimes would read a book and then identify with no, a movement. But for the most part, you were forced to interact with other people in your oh, surrounding area. In your area, geographical, your, in your physical, geographical proximity. physical location. And yeah. so what's happened is, well, now more and more... You don't have to identify with your community. You mm. identify with this online group. You have a group right. affinity, you have a affinity group. that's right. not based in geography. Um, and so that means that, you know, back in the day, if you were from Massachusetts, you just really hated South Carolina. You just well, hated. Well, I don't know if that's true. No, you hated South. The Yankees, the Yankees hated versus the people, Southerners. The Southerners. This, this has been a, for a hundred years. And okay. Okay. They All just, right. They just disliked each other. I mean, not like like you know like no, actively I don't know disliked. If this is but like, really true. Well, but so, I, I understand what right, you're saying. Right, but now you can right. It's not it's not that you dislike people you know, Southerners, right? If you're a liberal Massachusetts Massachusetts. Oh, I don't know what they call themselves. Whoever, guys, any of you from Massachusetts that want to call in and tell us, but, get, send us a message about what you call but yourselves. Macedonian. You know, you, Macedonian. Lived, no, it's, you don't call yourself Macedonian. I, used, I lived in, I lived in, Boston for two years. I should know this. Matt, Mass. I don't remember. I, that's you should really know. You, yeah, like, I like, lived you, there. You I don't there. remember Anyways. what I called myself. Yeah. The Commonwealth. Um, yes. They're Commonwealth, right? They are. Okay. So, uh, so essentially, uh, so now instead of, you know, you, you only dislike the Southerners who have a political opinion that you dislike, right? Yeah. The Southerners who are liberal, right, who are in Charleston and... Or are, who are not liberal, but whatever. You, it's, yeah. It's I, like who, yeah. who agree with you politically, yeah. that's who you identify yeah. with. And so it makes it much easier to um, identify on political differences, which, and then, and then of course, you just, you want to be in that, and, and it accelerates your own self-story about who you are, because, mm. you know, because think about, right, so when did gay rights kind of make the, because gay rights was like, everyone's like, oh, that's like of the devil, and then America's like, yeah, it's fine. Like, it went really fast. It was really fast. Really fast, and, and of course, you know, the big thing that, um, that influences it is, well, right, you meet someone, and they're actually, oh, I, I'm actually gay, right? And so I had the self-image of what being gay was, but actually Frank at the factory is gay. So now how can I reconcile my self-story and my self-image of right. mental model of what a uh, gay what person is right. with this thing I have in front of me, Frank, right. being in front of me, right? So because um, you had more community interaction, you were kind of forced to... You mean because people were online? No, no, no. B before, oh, before, right? So yeah. you were so, um, but now you can have, you can just reinforce your mental model. Oh, yeah. By being yeah. online and only being in the communities that you want. Yeah. Because you're not being f like, unless it's at work. You're not being forced to interact with. Well, you sometimes are, but me that's an interesting point. But not politically. Well, right? you're doing it um, uh, from a diversity standpoint. Well, think about it too. Yeah, yeah. Be that's interesting because if you think about. If you think about the number of interactions you have with people. With people. Every day. 
And how many of those are in physical proximity? Mm -hmm. How many of those are in voice, a voice like on the phone Mm -hmm. or on Skype? Uh, How many of those are through texting? And how many of those are through messaging online? You know, we're having... People are communicating more than ever. They're having... Like, you know, of all your interactions with somebody else in a day, what percentage is online? People. Well, maybe. Oh, you mean fewer people altogether? Then, then you, you're normally seen in person. I don't know. Your physical... I mean, think of all the bank tellers and grocery store attendants and people who pump your gas. Yeah. And I don't know. There's just... I feel so like do you think you're having more of which kind? I think, you know, young people who don't go to church, I don't I don't know. They're having more online. A lot more online. Yeah. But I think, but they're, but that's I, the thing with like, because like young yeah. people are all very, very liberal. And so if you're online, you'd be on cool websites that you think are cool, that all the young liberal people yeah. also think are cool. And therefore, right, you're not, you're just, you're, you're in your same pot. Whereas if, you know, you're at church, right? You got old people who are like yeah. dropping end bombs yeah. and yeah. you got like young liberal people. You know, you have like a much more... A big, a broader mix. Broader mix. So. It's interesting, huh? Yeah. No, it's... Um, uh, or, or maybe it's just, you know, the generations of respecting elders is gone and our generation just believes that we're always right and we don't need to listen to anyone else. I think most generations feel that when they're... At a certain age. So when you were, uh, like, 16. You mean 10 years ago? Yeah, 10 years ago when you were 16. <laughs> yeah, um, I remember. Did you, did you feel that, uh, that, that uh, you know, your generation knew what was right? Absolutely. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yes, we thought the older generations were just so out of touch with reality and what was true and real and important and wonderful and from your perspective which uh, a hint to the listeners was not a conservative viewpoint you mean when i was 16 yeah when you were 16 you uh, you weren't around how do you know you've heard stories I'm, guessing. I'm, I'm going to infer <laughs> okay yes um what was it about the older generations that you thought they were backwards and what was it about your current generation that you thought was forward thinking that that had it right well um, Maybe we can glean some insight. It's interesting. I mean, we, we, you know, those of us who are young, uh, we believed actually that the Great Depression that happened in the 1920s, late 1920s, 1929, early 30s, had kind of like scarred forever the, the people, older people that we were interacting with and that it made them very cautious and unable they didn't want to take risks um we we believed that there was uh, in world war ii you know we believed that had had an impact i mean i I think we were uh, i mean obviously making generalizations be meaner what what are the stupid old what were the stupid old people doing that were really they were they were rigid they were in what capacity I mean, you, they old, weren't your bones open. Get stiff. The, what? Your bones get stiff. You know <laughs> no, not fit. Well, they were physically rigid. <laughs> they weren't open to new the wonder the amazing new ideas that we felt as young people which, we had. Which were uh, peace, love, um, uh, uh, getting along, uh, long hair, rock and roll. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, the idea that uh, everyone should be equal and everyone should get along. And, you know, we felt that the older people were just very negative and um, were not open to new ideas. Just not open to new ideas. A closed minded, prejudiced, uh, st- stick in the muds. That's what we believe. But I don't, don't you think all young people believe that about old people in general? Isn't that just like a trend? Yeah. I mean, did you feel that way when you were 16? Of course. But in fairness, there is some truth to that because, <laughs> no, 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 no. But because, because if you look at like, cause there was some stuff, right? I mean, I, right. Like 
All right, wait, Maybe wait. you can't remember specifics, right? But do you, do you think, like, Nixon floating the U.S. currency away from the dollar was, like, a good idea? And, like, the old people are like, oh, well, that's a horrible idea, right? <laughs> you can't, right? And it's hard to do. But if you look at, so because that's, you know, because, like, economic stuff comes and goes. But, like, cultural stuff really has changed. I mean, when you're talking back from the people from the Great Depression and World War II, I mean, that's a generation who, large, who in large part thought interracial marriage was horrible. Well, yeah. So, right, so, like, when we're talking about how they, they were, like, old and behind, I mean... They were old They and were behind. old and behind, All right? right? But, so you know, you do that. realize that when you are older, the 16-year-old... When you're, like, 60 years old, there's going to be people who are 16. And they're going to think that you... Because we don't want people to be able to rigid. marry their toaster. And... You laugh about it. Uh, oh, oh would you, you marry laughing? their toaster... That, you know, what about do you, do you hear me ma- laughing? marry their robot? Oh, I think our generation would be fine with that. Maybe, maybe what I should, I mean, because I'm trying, because here, our generation is pretty open. You got to push it somewhere. What, what's the thing in 60 years that we're going to, that we as a generation would be like, would be too far? Uh, intergalactic marriages? You'd probably be all right with that. Fine with that. Yeah, that, that's the thing, right? Like, our generation is right, pretty I open. I don't know. I don't know. It might be, th- um... It could have to do with like genetic engineering stuff. It could have, mm, right? Okay. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Marrying, marrying your identical twin that was engineered to be a female version. Or of just, you know, uh, uh, siblings, uh, animals, changing bestiality. The, no, but changing the. I'm thinking of things that would be unconscionable to us as a generation, and it's a not a big list. What about what about? Um, uh, you know, uh, all the all the children are born via, uh, in, you know, all in, you know, all uh, insemination, etc. takes place in a lab. I don't and think people have a problem with that. Except that now you can uh, you can just weed out, you know, s- certain kinds of people, and you just want think, these kind of people. I don't people. think we have a problem with that. You don't. Really? Our generation? Yeah. That's okay. But what... what, I don't know. Would you be all right if, um, you know, people had to have blonde hair? And and you were not allowed to have a kid who was... No one on... You know, guys... If it was a boy, they had to... If if it was Mm -hmm. a boy and they were going to be under 5'8", then that they had to be a you know they, they were not allowed to that's, keep, that's though, not a, a viable embryo that's that's not that's more conservative so traditionally in the last 200 years we've gotten more liberal in our ideas saying that people can only do certain there things might be, be more the back the young people coming up behind you might be more conservative well, that, well if they're more conservative then then I could then I could definitely see that well I so, guess you're gonna find out I guess I'll find out so I just wanted to, you know, I kind of want to tie everything together. And the point of this kind of long excursion was that we're, I think we really are seeing a backlash against um, technology and globalization that, uh, ba- that basically has been going on really, really strong since the 90s. Um, and, you know, this whole podcast... For the most part, you know, we talk about um, technology and we talk about change and we talk about the fanciest new gadgets and cool brain research and all this, you know, stuff going on. And it, it's just kind of a presumption that this is the way the world is going and this is kind of technology and it's fun, it's exciting and robots and it's all very interesting and dangerous. But at the same time, like this is the direction the world wants to go, which is pro-technology, um, pro kind of global internet culture and i think that's an assumption that we especially you know in the western media which we i guess we can officially say we are uh because we have a podcast um that's an assumption that we have that you know might not be true now maybe in maybe you this is a simple simply a bump in the road and once some of the uh, you know, older, more conservative compatriots, unfortunately, move on, that we will, you know, that, that it's, you know, that will, that that will change. And, uh, but obviously with the Brexit vote and with the, ri- and with the 
kind of anti-globalization movements um, to in in the United States and in a lot of Europe as well. It's not just that's why people are so worried because it's not just England. It's Austria and it's Germany. Maybe not so much Germany, but definitely uh, lot, lot, lots of places all over the world. Um, you're kind of seeing this this kind of uh, backlash. India, India is doing a lot of it. That's uh, you've you've been to India. You definitely yeah. seen that. Been in India a couple times. So, um, uh, yeah, so we got distracted a little far afield, but I, I just thought, uh, I just thought it was important that we, that we talk about it. And, uh, I think, I think, uh, we'll see what happens. Hopefully there's not some sort of horrible ripple and the economy goes down in shambles. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess. I think it's always interesting to question, uh, assumptions. So there you go. Okay, well, um, we, we got to get going anyways, but this has been fun. I'm glad we got to put one in on the road. And then I want you to remind our yes. listeners oh, thank you. of all the things we need to remind all them right. of. Uh, so here's our re- reminder. Which we should always do at the beginning. We always forget to. Always forget. So first, like us and promote us in any way you want. That would be great. iTunes ratings is wonderful. If you have questions... Email them to info at the teamw.com. Uh, you can tweet at uh, Susan at it's at the brain lady. Um, you can go to the teamw.com to see our full listing of all the cool stuff we do, including lists of our upcoming talks and where we're going to be, um, which right now is a little empty because we just got through our very busy uh, summer, summer season. It's, it's quiet. Yeah, it's everyone takes vacations in summer, so we don't get a lot of gigs. Um, we have, if you go to courses.theteamw.com, we have a lot of courses. They've been selling pretty well recently, so this is this is good for us. But we also have a course. We have a, a number of different things that are free. So if you like free stuff, you just sign up, and then you get to do free things. Um, and uh, yeah, with the it's very hot here in Champaign, and uh, we'll we'll hopefully have another podcast very shortly. Um, Susan, thank you. Yeah, thanks. And uh, we'll talk to you all next week. Bye. Bye.